Let's begin at the top with the Canyon Plateau region. In this region are some of the most spectacular geographic images to be found in the United States. Of course, there is one of the most famous sites in the world, the Grand Canyon. On the Utah border is huge Lake Powell, man-made by Glen Canyon Dam. The many canyons it fills create more beachfront property than the entire west coast of the United States. Toward New Mexico, on the Navajo Reservation, is Monument Valley, which you've seen in many old western movies. And a bit south of there is Canyon de Chelly. There is the Painted Desert, which isn't really a desert at all, but a high arid steppe. West of there, you'll find Sunset Crater, the last volcano to erupt in Arizona about 900 years ago. Close by is Meteor Crater, which was made in a matter of moments when a meteorite from outer space slammed into Earth. Mount Humphrey is an old volcano, 12,670 feet high. That puts it up in the range of America's highest points. Its peak is above the timberline, and technically that area is alpine tundra. So far, these are all pretty desolate looking places, but the lower portion of the Canyon Plateau region includes the world's largest forest of ponderosa pines, as well as the lush White Mountains. The lower edge of the region is the beautiful Mogollon Rim. What is called the Central High Basin and Mountain Region runs diagonally across the state. Here you'll find areas that look like parts of the American Midwest or Eastern states. And you'll also find the eerie looking Joshua Tree Forest. Also scattered throughout the region are numerous rugged areas such as the Salt River Canyon. And the Superstition Mountains, famous for the Lost Dutchman's Gold Mine. Some such ranges offer a wide variety of climates and vegetation depending on their height. Take the Bradshaw Mountains for example, they appear rocky and desert-like from below, but drive up to the top and you find a thick forest. And then, especially in the southeastern portions of the region, one finds rolling grassland. The third physiographic region includes the lower basin and ranges, the very identifiable Sonoran Desert. Parts of it include forests of literally millions of saguaro cacti, which grow only in this desert, as well as scores of other unique botanical species. Parts of the region can seem desolate with endless stretches that appear simply flat and dry, interrupted occasionally by relatively small mountain ranges, typically three to 4,000 feet in elevation, too low and too hot to support thick vegetation, much less forest areas. One notable exception is Kitt Peak, which around 7,000 feet is the site of a solar observatory. Then back across the desert to the west, near Yuma, is an outcropping of sand dunes, no different from those of North Africa's Sahara Desert. It seems ironic that Arizona's major cities are to be found not in the more comfortable high basin and mountain region, but in the Sonoran Desert like Phoenix, the fifth largest city in America, with its metro area totaling more than three million people, sprawls across a hot desert valley, which one day in the 1990s experienced a record high temperature of 122 degrees Fahrenheit in the shade. 
And speaking of towns, atop a mesa on the Hopi Indian Reservation in northeastern Arizona sits a village called Old Oribe. It is the oldest continuously inhabited community in North America. Folks called it home long before Columbus sailed across the Atlantic, long before the Spanish conquistadors saw the American continent. At the same time, a couple hundred miles to the south and west, in a flat valley, there were villages occupied by people called the Hohokam, farmers who developed an irrigation system. It's in the nature of human beings to live together in communities, and in a community setting, people tend to get things organized. Look at today's cities. The physical geography is usually planned. Stores and shops are developed in strips or centers or malls. Factories are in designated industrial areas. A great deal of money is spent on highways and streets. Citizens want entertainment and culture. And of course, politically, we are organized from state legislatures to city councils, down to the newest idea, the Neighborhood Association. How does a big city become a big city? There are basically two ways. We've been flying over what we would think of as Phoenix, a seemingly endless stretch of development, but it's not really one city. It's an example of a linked suburb area. Phoenix is the center and the largest, but it's surrounded by a dozen or more significant suburbs with names like Tempe, Mesa, Scottsdale, Glendale, and others. Each was founded as a separate town, then grew together into a metropolitan area. By contrast, 100 miles to the south, Tucson is a single primate city. Founded in 1775 as a northern outpost of the Spanish Empire, it grew over the centuries, but grew primarily as Tucson. Even today, it has only a couple of outlying suburbs.